about to hear God's words. So let's join together in the prayer for illumination. Lord, we all need your light and your truth. More than anything, we need you. And you are here. You are here for us. And you have brought this word here for us, for this time, in this space, for each one of us here and us here together. We who have ears to hear, let us listen and hear what you have to say to us today. Amen. I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Immediately he, Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And, began, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when he got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to Christ. Thank you, Mandy. You guys are lucky when I made that announcement in the first service, I cried about the retreat thing. We're using the Lord's Prayer to look at all of Matthew, to attempt to understand as best we can with our minds who Jesus was and is, to attempt to let our emotions be grasped by his lordship. Uh, for those of us that are considering the gospel, to understand the gospel as best we can so that we might consider whether to give our allegiance to Jesus. Last week we talked about healing, and um, I think I was more clear on what not to do than what to do, and as any good parent or teacher would probably tell you, both are pretty important. We talked about what not to do because we are a community that is supposed to offer healing through community and friendship mostly, also through the power of our prayers. And we talked about how when someone's grieving or sick, don't ask them what you can do. But I don't think I was as clear about what to do. Here's what you do. And this is where I'm exercising the right of the lead pastor to talk a little more about the thing that I wanted to talk more about last week but forgot. Here's what you do. You come up with something that's easy to say yes or no to. And you offer that. Whether it's a meal or a little bit of your time or something else. Because of the love of Jesus, we offer to our friends who are sick and grieving friendship. They need less time but more specific love in those cases. And this week we're going to talk about the miracles that Jesus performed that didn't have to do with healing. Of course, his healings were miraculous, but I think it's helpful to separate the miracles like walking on water, calming the storm, pulling a coin out of a fish's mouth. You remember that one? A lot going on there for just a few verses. It's an artificial distinction, but a helpful one to understand this humble king. And it's essential that we pay attention to Jesus' humility. Both his strength, because humility is not um, weakness or um, unimpressiveness. It's an honest reckoning of our strength and our worth and what we are good at and we're not good at before God and one another. And it's so rare, isn't it? 
Jesus rejected military power, which is a big part of the reason that so many could not or would not hear the message of his gospel because the people of Israel wanted Rome gone. Jesus rejected religious power, as it were, while teaching that there is a a, a religion that is so much more profound than we think. We think of religion as what we do that has to do with um, our beliefs in the supernatural. We think of religion as, if I do this, God will do this, and Jesus taught such a more profound, integrated, large thing. That's why they called it followers of the way in the first century. Christian was actually a neg- had a negative connotation at the time. Jesus rejected economic power even while telling us to be generous. And of course he rode into uh, Jerusalem on a donkey, played by Eddie Murphy in the hit film Shrek. Because even in the first century that would not happen. We wouldn't see a king do that. Even in the 18th century we would not see a king do anything like that. How many of you watched the coronation a few weeks or months ago? Now, because that's connected to the Church of England, there were actual moments of at least uh, visible, how do I want to say this? There's potential humility. I don't know because I'm not the Lord. Because it was a religious service, and yet look at the, just the garments and the amount of vehicles and animals. Were animals involved, Simon? Probably, Yeah. I'm going to watch some of it. I haven't yet. And that's not the kind of king that those of us who are Christians have given our allegiance to. Because he wasn't beginning something military. He wasn't beginning something economic. He wasn't even beginning something religious, depending on how we define religion. If we define it the way Jesus did, then sure. But it's bigger, it's more profound than that. So the humble king displayed his power over nature, which helps us hear him with so much greater seriousness. You know, Jesus said to avoid sin. He said so multiple times in Matthew. He said, dishonors God, harms neighbor, and harms self. Even just to think certain things, which might sound harsh to you unless he's going to take all the punishment for that and then guide you away from that for the rest of your life and guide you into a healed and healing life. He was so serious about sin that he said multiple times, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Amplified language, waving his arms, (laughs) begging us to understand, not begging, imploring us to understand how dangerous to our humanity and our neighbor and our sense of our relationship with God it is to sin. And not just what we do, But even our interior lives, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, he said. And then, when you see him walk, when the disciples see him walking on water, it was that much more evident to them how seriously they needed to take that command. Jesus said, uh, don't judge. And that doesn't mean don't have an opinion. That doesn't mean there isn't foolishness and wisdom in the world. It means when you see something foolish, don't judge that person as less than human. And we may or may not agree with that philosophically. But we see Jesus through the lens of Scripture feeding the 5,000, which was really probably about 11,000. And we take so much more seriously his command to avoid judgment. He told us not to worry. And that doesn't mean that your concerns in the world are not legitimate, but they can get the best of you when they become over-concerns. It's a little bit like the flip side of what the Bible calls idolatry, where a good desire and a good thing in the world means too much to us and distracts us from love for God. It's become something that can't, it it could never deliver, but we're asking it to deliver in ways that only God can. Worry is like that too. Of course you have legitimate concerns in the world. They're not supposed to get the best of you because this king has given you himself, taken away your sin through his work and forgiven you and freed you into a life of life. Jesus said, don't doubt. 
And that doesn't mean don't have thoughts. It means engage your questions. Thomas is my favorite disciple. He didn't actually touch Jesus either. And then you know what he did after Jesus appeared to him at the end? He walked to India, and there are still Christians there who did not have the institutional support of the church for a long time. And they're still followers of Jesus because he engaged his doubts. And when Jesus said that, the disciples heard him, and then when he rebuked a storm, he wasn't just like, calm down, storm, please. He rebuked it. And they were that much more interested in engaging their doubts. And Jesus said, fear not. And it's the same as worry. You have legitimate fears. Come by them honestly, but they are not to get the best of you because God exists. He has made himself known. He has entered our lives and hearts by faith and he will never leave us or forsake us. And we will feel like it and we talk with him about that and we go back to the text and we come back to church and we come back to our songs and one another and remind one another that we have him and he has us because he's that good. This is literally what it says in my notes. This is not a metaphor. Jesus is not a life coach. It doesn't matter if you get out of the boat. The point is... (laughs) Because people sometimes want to turn this story into a metaphor. And I'm sure there's a version of that that's helpful to someone and not distracting. The point of the story is to look at Jesus and see him clearly. And see him reaching for Peter. And see his power over nature. Because, to quote my favorite exegete, The winds obeyed him because they remembered his voice from creation. Sally Lloyd-Jones. I was re-watching one of my favorite westerns the other day, Tombstone. Wyatt Earp is in big trouble with his gang of five, and he gets them out of an impossible situation. And afterwards... Turkey Creek Jack Johnson, I think that's his name, is looking for Wyatt. And Doc Holliday says, he's down by the creek, walking on water. Because if you get your group out of an impossible situation, it's that much easier to trust him the next time he tells them what to do and where to go. Right? Jesus, the humble King displays his power over nature beyond our imaginations. They ask him about paying the temple tax in Matthew. This is not the give to Caesar what is Caesar's. This is a different time. And at least three things are going on here because Jesus was such an interesting teacher, sometimes speaking overly directly in the sense of like, that was a little on the nose, Jesus. Yeah, that's because you're not going to pay attention unless I teach it that way. And then other times teaching very subtly. They ask him if he's going to pay the temple tax, and he kind of responds like, uh, FYI, it's my temple. Should I really have to pay for if it's my temple? He alludes to the fall of Jerusalem that's going to happen about 30 years after this. And then he says, but to not distract you, Peter, go ahead and go catch a fish. Peter goes and he catches a fish. In the fish's mouth is a coin that paid both Jesus' temple tax and Peter's tax. So the humble king displays his power over nature beyond our imaginations. And also, there's some wisdom embedded in this, so at least four things. So, so he's alluding to the fact that it's his temple. He does not want this discussion to get in the way of his message, which is, I think, part of the reason that he paid the tax. And he's alluding to the fall of the temple in the future. And now, if you go to the Sea of Galilee, you might find a fish called a Chromus Simonis, named after Simon Peter. 
And it's a fish in the Sea of Galilee and in the, the, some of the rivers nearby that's mouth is big enough to hold that coin. And I'm sorry that my Latin is not very good. Greek and Hebrew, pretty good. Latin, no good. I apologize. The humble king displayed his power over nature beyond our imagination. When he fed 5,000 men, and that's just how they counted. That's why it's said that way. It's probably about 11,000 people. Why? To everyone there, immediately it would be a sign. Oh, this is a new and better Moses. The people looked lost. They had no nourishment. Jesus gathered them and feeds them miraculously and nourishes them. The humble king displays his power over nature beyond our imaginations that we would know the sweetness of the kingdom. Yesterday I almost changed my outline because it just is a little bit too nice. I decided not to change it because, you know, all the people and all the things and all the places that it's in. Jesus taught in both a sweet way and in direct ways. He told parables that are very challenging to us because of who the God figure is in the parable. And he also performed a very odd miracle. He withered a tree. It doesn't say he killed the tree. Probably, you know, but what, we don't know. Why? Why did he wither the fig tree? There's some eschatological reasons. We'll actually talk about that last time. Eschatology is end times. To understand your Bible, you need to understand that word. I don't like using churchy words, except when I think they're important. We'll talk more about that next week. The other reason that he withered the fig tree is for us to understand the danger of rejecting him. It will wither your soul to reject his kingship in your life. And you can reject it through hypocrisy, through believing in him, but not trusting him and actually living out your faith. You can live out your faith, but not actually trust him internally, and no one can see that. And that will wither your soul. And I feel a little bit bad for the tree, but Jesus decided to make his point that way. Similar to the six times in the book of Matthew that he refers metaphorically, but very aggressively, to hell as both a reality on earth for those not trusting him and a reality afterwards. Jesus fed the 4,000. Remember how many baskets? And when he fed the 5,000, they gathered 12 baskets, symbolizing that now faith in him, or uh, now Israel is, how do I want to say this? Faith in God now flows through him, and that completes the role of the nation of Israel. There's mystery surrounding that, Romans uh, 9, 10, and 11, but that's why that symbolized that. That's why there were 12 baskets, and because there were 12. Then he feeds the 4,000, and how many baskets do they pick up? Seven. Both because there were seven baskets and because that symbolizes completion, that this kingdom is for everyone. For all who know that they're lost and without nourishment, without Jesus, come to him and receive the rest of God, Matthew 11. Come and receive the stability of soul, Matthew 7, that only Jesus offers. Come and receive the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. The king displayed this power beyond our imaginations that we would know the sweetness and the danger of rejecting that kingdom and that king. Would you pray with me? Jesus, enliven our minds that we might understand you in greater depth. We trust you. We long for it to be easier to trust you with our minds and hearts, with our actions, with our stuff, with our gifts, with our money, with our families. We indeed believe, Lord, that you have saved and rescued us. 
We long for your return. In the meantime, would you fill us with a sense of your Holy Spirit leading and guiding us, comforting us, convicting us, encouraging us. Amen.